Hello, I'm Brian Farrell, and welcome to Pace IT's session on Common Network Threats Part 2. Today I'm going to be talking about more outside threats, and then I'm going to be talking about some wireless network threats. I have a fair amount of ground to cover, so let's go ahead and begin this session. Of course, I'm going to begin by talking about outside threats. Because of how they are implemented, it is often difficult to put network security threats into a single category. Many attempts to breach a network combine different aspects of different threats. For example, a man-in-the-middle attack is often combined with some type of spoofing that is used to help it succeed. That means that in most cases, security requires more than just a single line of defense. Good administrators recognize this and implement multiple layers of security in order to harden and protect their systems. The first major threat that we're going to talk about is the denial of service threat, or the DOS threat. This covers a very broad category of threats to networks and systems. That's because DOS covers any threat that can potentially keep users or customers from using network resources as designed. A traditional DOS attack attempts to flood a network with enough traffic to bring it down. It's commonly used with a flood of malformed ICMP requests. The host that receives the flood can be so busy dealing with the deluge of data that it cannot respond to legitimate requests. Then there's the permanent DOS attack. It's an attempt to permanently deny a network resource for others. It can be achieved by physically destroying or removing the resource, or it can also be achieved through the use of malware that corrupts or damages the underlying digital system to the point where it cannot be repaired and must be replaced. There are also friendly or unintentional denial of service attacks. An unintended DOS attack can occur when poorly written applications consume more network resources than are available. Another unintentional DOS attack can occur when a network interface controller, or NIC, begins to fail. It's quite common when a NIC is about to fail for it to go offline and come back online repeatedly and rapidly. This consumes network resources which can cause an unintentional DOS. More disruptive than the standard denial of service attack is the distributed denial of service attack or the DDOS attack. It's a denial of service attack in which more than a single system is involved in sending the attack. A DDOS attack has a higher chance of succeeding due to the increased number of participants. The machines used to send the attack may be voluntary participants, this is called a coordinated attack, or they may be part of a botnet. With the botnet, malware has been installed on the machines and they are no longer under the complete control of their owners. Many distributed denial of service attacks involve botnets where the attacker has actually rented the botnet for the sole purpose of performing the DDoS. The goal of the DDoS is to create a large enough spike in traffic that the target becomes unreachable. In some cases, the target system may need to be rebooted in order for it to come back online. There's the reflective denial of service attack. It's also known as an amplified DOS. The attacker uses some method, usually some form of spoofing, to hide the source of the attack. In a reflective DNS attack, the attacker usually spoofs the intended target's IP address and sends multiple requests to an open DNS server. The DNS server responds by sending traffic back to the targeted system, and the attacker's hope is that the response from the DNS server will overwhelm the targeted system. A cousin to the reflective DNS attack is the reflective NTP attack, or the reflective network time protocol attack. It works in the same way. However, instead of using DNS, it relies upon open NTP servers. Not very common anymore, but you still need to know about it, are the Smurf attacks, also known as smurfing. 
It's a type of reflective denial of service attack that also involves spoofing the intended target's IP address. A network is flooded with ICMP requests in which the source address for the requests appear to be that of the intended target. As the replies return, the network becomes slowed down by the traffic. The goal is to overwhelm the target system and bring it down. It's time to move on to wireless network threats. Our first topic is an unintended threat. A common feature on modern wireless access points is Wi-Fi Protected Setup, or WPS. The goal of WPS is to create an easy and secure method for consumers and small businesses to set up a secure wireless network. Unfortunately, the outcome has fallen short of the goal. While WPS does ease the setup burden, it is also easily exploited by an attacker and should actually be disabled on all equipment. This exploit has been known for a couple of years, and you would think that equipment manufacturers would quit enabling WPS by default on their equipment, but that's not the case. So when you set it up, you need to disable WPS. Then there's war driving or war chalking. This is the practice of attempting to sniff out unprotected or minimally protected wireless networks. Once it's found, marks are placed on buildings and streets indicating that networks are available and vulnerable. Something to remember is that wireless networks are vulnerable merely due to the fact that they need to broadcast over the air. Then there's WEP cracking or WPA cracking. This is using a packet sniffer to capture the password and or the pre-shared key on a wireless network. Wired Equivalent Privacy, or WEP, can be cracked in minutes. Wi-Fi Protected Access, or WPA cracking, will take hours, but it can still be cracked. Neither of these encryption standards should be used on your wireless networks. Rogue access point attacks are another threat that you need to be aware of. This is where an unauthorized WAP gets installed onto the network. Unfortunately, the biggest culprits are the end users themselves. They install their own wireless access points for convenience and then don't properly secure it. This opens a vulnerability into your network. You need to periodically check for rogue access points on your networks, even if you don't have wireless installed. Related to the rogue wireless access point attack is the evil twin attack. A WAP is installed and configured with an SSID that is very similar to the authorized version. As users access the evil twin, their keystrokes are captured in the hopes of gaining sensitive information, like the credentials to log into the actual wireless network. The evil twin attack can also be considered as a type of wireless phishing attack. Then there's bluejacking. Bluejacking is the sending of unsolicited messages over a Bluetooth connection in an effort to keep the target from responding to valid requests. It's more of an annoyance than an actual network threat because it mostly involves the personal area network, which tend to be very limited in their abilities. Related to bluejacking is blue snarfing. It's an attack in which the attacker creates a Bluetooth connection with another device without that device's permission. The goal is to retrieve information from the attacked device, as in contact information or stored email. This vulnerability has been patched and may no longer be a concern, but you still need to be aware of it. Now that concludes this session on Common Network Threats Part 2. I talked about outside threats, and I concluded with some wireless network threats. On behalf of Pace IT, thank you for watching this session, and I hope to do another one soon.